Hi, it's Louisa Dahl. And welcome to the Interactive Minds podcast, where I talk with passionate marketers, innovators, and digital leaders about their specific recipes for success. In today's show, I finally got to interview Kate Toon, talking about courses and podcasts and being an entrepreneur. I've been trying to tee up this podcast with Kate all year, and we finally got around to it. I do have a bit of a croaky voice today for some reason, so please excuse any coughs or squeaks. Here's three things you're going to learn in today's episode. One, why you need to listen to your audience and how you can go about it. Two, the steps that Kate uses to launch and deliver her sellout course. And three, why podcasting success is still a bit of a dark art. Let's get into it. Today, I'm super excited to be here with the one and only Kate Toon. Kate is super hard to describe in one sentence. She is an expert in SEO and copywriting. She's an author, a business owner, a podcaster, an educator. I hear she's also a hula hooper expert, and she has a conference, courses, and membership that help business owners to be coached in their digital marketing journey. There you go. It's a long sentence, but I got there. Welcome to the Interactive Minds podcast, Kate. Hurrah. Lovely to be here. Yes, it's it's a bit of a mouthful for me, and I'm, I'm me, even I'm <laughs> in one line. So yeah. Now today is super exciting because not only is Kate on the Interactive Minds podcast, but I've also just recorded an interview for her podcast. So we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. Make sure you check it out. As our listeners can tell from the intro, there's a lot of things that you do. How do you describe your business and your role? Um, I mean, I guess when people say, you know, what are you? I'd say, I'd have to say I'm an entrepreneur, which I hate. So I call myself a misfit entrepreneur, which is also the title of my book, because I don't feel like I fit the kind of usual entrepreneur mode. But at heart, you know, I'm a digital marketer. That's my background, advertising, you know, events, um, copywriting, production. I was a producer for a long time. So I'm a digital marketer, really. And I just kind of, you know, put that digital marketing in the out into the world in a number of different formats, as you described. <laughs> awesome. Now tell us, what is a misfit entrepreneur to you? Well, I guess, you know, when you hear the word entrepreneur, it often makes you think of some guy in a shiny suit with, with excessively white teeth lying on the bonnet of a car talking about his seven-figure business, you know? And I don't have a car, I don't have particularly white teeth, and um, I don't own a suit. So, you know, I am an entrepreneur. I mean, an entrepreneur, but, you know, I wrote a book on it. So the entre- an entrepreneur, literal meaning just means a business owner who takes risks. So we're all entrepreneurs. But I think it has a new meaning in this modern digital world of, you know, somebody who works two hours a week in a hammock, uh, somebody who has a lot of passive income, courses, whatever. So I do have passive income and I'm aggressively doing air fingers because there's nothing passive about it. <laughs> I've got courses, memberships, books, templates, you know, a lot of digital products that sell, but I don't have a business plan. I don't have a team. I don't have angel investors. I don't own a beanbag. And yes, I guess it's just a non-traditional route, I guess. Yes, totally. Now you've been working for yourself for what I calculated about 16 years. Is that about right? About 12. Yeah. I mean, I started my copywriting business four years before, but I just sneakily did it while I had a real job. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Awesome. Yeah. And before that, you were working in agency land quite a bit. When you look yeah. back over your career to date, what's what are some of the highlights that stand out to you? Leaving agency? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I started off at you know, university. I did, you know, I was a DJ and I was writing for the local magazine and interviewing pop stars. So that was really cool. And then, you know, when I came down to London, I worked in events and I really enjoyed running events, you know, getting like famous comedians at the time to be MCs at like beautiful hotels. I really enjoyed all of that. And then, you know, discovering websites, which was probably back in 1996. And the first major website I worked on was the Marks and Spencer's e-commerce site, which was the first big e-commerce site in the UK. And we actually launched it on the BT internet. BT is like the Optus in Australia. There were so many people working for BT. They had 70,000 employees that it was like wow. the internet. So we tested the whole site there to see how do people buy online? Because no one could buy online before that, you know? Amazing. And that was really cool. And then, you know, in Australia, you got to work on some some big brands in agency world, but agency life was very taxing, you know, and as I climbed up the ladder and became like head of digital production and, you know, it was, 
I didn't enjoy being a boss and I didn't enjoy having lots of people report to me. So the, a big highlight for me was leaving and starting my own thing, really. Yeah, yeah. And what's your favourite thing about your work now? I think just the freedom to do whatever the hell I like, whether it's good or bad. You know, so I come to my office in the morning and I decide what my day is going to look like, what my week is going to look like. And sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. But I love being, you know, captain of my own ship and and being able to be creative how I choose to be creative, not being too hemmed in by other people's expectations. Yeah, yeah. Now, when I hear about all the things that you're working on, and I hear this through, I think, you know, Facebook, I hear it through your podcast, a whole range of different channels, it sounds like occasionally, or I feel like everything you touch turns to gold. I feel like your courses sell out, your membership's thriving, your podcast has a great audience. What do you think your secret to success is? And I'll ask you in a moment about whether this is a, a real vision or not. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's interesting. I said in my group the other day that I feel like I could, you know, make something, paint it blue, put it on a sales page and sell it in a couple of hours. <laughs> you know? It does feel like that at the moment. It hasn't always felt like that. Mm. I, I think the secret to my success is I really, really listen to my audience. So I don't make anything that I haven't already essentially sold. So it, this was a, an example of a bad decision to answer your next question, which is coming, I know. I launched something the other day where I was like, oh, you know, one thing I've done really, really well in my business is diversify my income. You know, I've got multiple income sources um, so that when one flags, another can take over. And also it keeps me very interested. So I launched this little thing about, I'm going to teach people how to diversify their income, digital income. You know, I wrote the sales page at eight o'clock in the morning. I'd coded it myself by nine. I put it on sale by 10 and it was sold out by midday. You know, I got like 50 people to sign up, which was my limit because I was, it was a new thing. You know, I wanted to test it out. And then I was like, oh God, now I have to deliver this thing. <laughs> you know? And I think it, it can be a real, a real negative in my business because I could, it's like, just because I could do something, should I do it? And very much part of my strategy at the moment is to kind of maybe take a bit more of an Amy Porterfield approach. You know, essentially she has two core courses, one about, I think about membership, one about building your list. And yes, she talks to a lot of other things, but really she has two essential products that she relaunches again and again and again. Mm. You have too many things. I think, you know, who would have thought, but you can have too much, many things and therefore lose focus and, you know, Robert Garish is a big, uh, someone that I admire quite a lot. And, you know, he's always saying, you know, just because you could doesn't mean you should. Like, you know, you're sitting in, you could make money doing anything. You're sitting in your car at a traffic light. You could have a little bucket in your car, <laughs> pack it, just nip out and clean some people's windows. But should you be doing that? You know, so it's a hard one. And it's a big decision for me about what, what I do next and whether it's in line with any kind of vision, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I want to come back and talk a little bit more about that in a moment, actually. But before we do that, I'd like to go back to what you said around listening to your audience. What does that mean to you? And what insights have you perhaps got that you've been able to use in an effective way that you might not otherwise know about your audience? There's two different examples I can give there. So I've got two different membership groups. And what I'll often see is like, the same topics coming up again and again. So, you know, recently everyone in my digital master chefs group is already excited about YouTube, you know? So therefore what I do is, even though I would quite like to talk about something completely different next month in the group, I go out, I find three, two YouTube experts, I bring them into the group and that's going to be the focus of, of next month's masterclass. We're doing YouTube 101, we're doing YouTube SEO. Um, and that's not necessarily selling something, but it's retaining members because mm. I'm giving and then trying to look into the future and go and then after that we're going to do this because some we keep talking about this and so listening to those guys and then also seeing things they're struggling with like you know one of the things they struggle with is putting together podcast episode notes and it's like I'm pretty good at that I've got a template why don't I just whack that into something a bit prettier and pop it in my shop you know and it'll sit there and sell and then with my big course my recipe course because I've run it now 16 times I know exactly how people feel in week three and they get to week four and they're like, oh no, I bought this course and I'm not going to finish it. Oh my God. So being able to then understand that pain point and pop something into the group just at that moment, that's reassuring, encouraging and keeps them on track. And everyone goes, oh my God, it's like, it's like you're listening into my brain. And it's like, because I know what you're thinking. And it's, I think being an empathetic business owner and a digital marketer is a wonderful thing. It can be a dangerous thing as well. But that empathy for your customers, 
just means that it's you're on point and you don't really need to sell because they have a pain point and you're offering them a solve, a solution, a, a medicine, a cure, and it doesn't feel like selling. And yeah. I think that's works yeah and you have these groups where I guess you get to interact and you get to see these conversations and and kind of get these insights what advice would you have someone who doesn't perhaps have a Facebook group or maybe they're not as active to get those insights are there any other ways that you used to do it before you had this kind of resource to tap into well, look, I've never been much of a survey person because I find a survey quite a blunt tool. You know, I can pick some, I can pick from three boxes and, you know, it just feels like a chore doing a survey. So, you know, I think really important thing is just to reply to emails and just email your customers or even call them up. Uh, one thing I do when anyone joins my community is I, you know, on the day of joining, I will just pick 20 people at random and ring them straight after they buy the course and go, hey, and people are horrified. They're like, oh my God, you're a real person. Uh, but it's nice. And I just go, you know, what, why did you, why did you join? What are you hoping to get out of it? And, um, you know, and have an actual conversation with people. And equally when people leave, you know, then I do send them a survey to say, you know, what didn't, what didn't you like? Or when people don't buy my big course, but they've been on the wait list, I say, why didn't you buy? And it's a part, partially for affirmation and reassurance because 95% of people just say, look, it's not the right time or I don't have the money right now. It's very few that go, the course looks rubbish and I don't like you, you know, so <laughs> therefore I don't need to change my offering. It's just a matter of time or a matter of price. And I'm not, you know, the price is, I think, fair, so I can't change that. So therefore it's just a waiting game. But if somebody did flag, like somebody did say, we sent one extra email this round before the course launched and somebody said, you just sent me so many emails, you, I got sick of you you know and I'm like okay that's interesting and it's one I've never had that feedback and that one extra email was what tipped them over yeah interesting maybe I had just too many emails in my pre-sales funnel and I won't be doing that again if I've got a message to send I'll add it to one of the existing emails rather than sending another one so you know just listening and asking I think yeah, I love that. And it's so important. And yet it's something that I think a lot of marketers who maybe are at a bit more arm's length from their customers don't want to or don't take the time to speak to customers. And I think it's something that, you know, if we could all do that on a regular basis and put that in our calendars as a must do, it would help us all to get better results because obviously there's nothing like hearing it from the horse's mouth or, you know, whoever you're trying to target. But it's scary. So I'm just about to survey all the members of my, my membership and say, what don't you like about the group? And I'm not looking forward to getting that email. Whenever I do a conference, and you obviously have your conference as well, we send a post-conference email and I have to I actually have to wait three months before yeah. I let that. Me too. I <laughs> well, I didn't get uh, a mini eclair and I saw another woman take two mini eclairs, you know, and I'm like, I can't read that straight after the event because I've just put my heart and soul into it and you're complaining about the eclairs. So it's scary to do, but it is. It's- done it's painful but it has to be done yeah let's talk a bit more about your courses so you just gave a great example of how you decided to launch a course and you did it very quickly how do you decide what format you're going to use for that what's the content going to be how do you know where that's going to go I think my first course my big course the recipe for success course came out of a day-long workshop um so I used to run this SEO workshop and it ran for like seven hours and therefore that falls very nicely into a seven week course because at the end of the seven hour workshop people were literally dead you know (laughs) and they hadn't really you know it's just too much information they couldn't take it all in I was trying to get too much in so you know I just kind of think of broad topics then I try and break them down. And then the biggest, the hardest thing for me is working out what not to include. So my, actually my, my SEO course for a long time, I kept adding to it and adding to it because I wanted to give more and more value for money. And I, you know, I wanted to make people think it was really amazing. But then I noticed the completion rate going down and down and down because there was just too much. And there's a real skill in not overloading people, not overwhelming people, giving them just enough so they can have a sense of achievement. You know, so for example, I used to have like bonus videos of we've just done the local SEO module and here's a bonus video of an interview with me and Bob talking about local SEO. People felt that they had to watch the interview with Bob. It didn't really. It was a bonus, but they felt like they had to and it was another thing to do and then they didn't finish the local SEO module and they felt bad and it wasn't a good experience. So these days I'm really trying to, Focus on learning outcomes, you know, people buying progress, not products, and and helping people have a sense of achievement 
even if there are a few little gaps in their knowledge, because then they can continue the journey, but there's only so much we can absorb in one week, for example, and I'm I'm having to try and pair it back a little bit. I'm not sure that even answered your question, but yeah. No, that's really interesting. Do you have a set amount of time that a course goes for? Yeah, so my big course runs for seven weeks and then they get an additional uh, week. So seven weeks of content, but I give three months of support. And again, that was a big decision for me because in, the, in when you start off doing a course, you're like, yeah, you can have lifetime support. <laughs> and, you, know, you have 900, I think now it's up to, we're just going to tip over a, a, a thousand people having done the big course. A thousand people asking me questions every day for free forever. What was I thinking? No, no you they, don't want that. <laughs> so about you know, two years ago, I had to go out to everybody and just say, and I was really honest and say, look, I, this is something I thought I could do. I didn't have the foresight. I'll give you another couple of months of free support because yeah. that's something I promise. But I'm being transparent here and I'm very transparent in, in how I operate and if I make a mistake. So for example, that Biz Diversify thing that I launched, I realized I don't have time to deliver that the way I want to deliver it. So I had to awkwardly and rather embarrassingly email everyone who bought it and say, it's not going to happen. Have your money back. Uh-huh. You know, we, many people would take it as a huge failure. How embarrassing. But I'm like, it's not embarrassing. It's still something that might happen one day. No one lost out. Everyone got their money back. It just is what it is. I got excited. I launched something. But it has, it has made me be a bit more circumspect. I really need to, you know, not get carried away because that's I have a tendency of getting overexcited about things. <laughs> it's it's fun creating stuff, isn't it? I think that's the challenge. It's so much fun getting to that point and putting it up there and going, yes, I've done this. But, but it's fun selling stuff. And then you're like, oh God, now I have to deliver it. Oh yeah. my God. So yeah, it's important to enjoy both parts of the process, not just the selling part. Yeah, definitely. Now what do you think in terms of someone listening who might be thinking of creating a course? What level of experience do you need to actually be able to create a course? Do you have an opinion on that? Look, I, I do. I think you have to have done it. You know, I think you have to have had some skin in the game. You have to have, you know, like you can't be a football court coach unless you've played a few matches, you know, like (laughs) I think some people kind of, you know, they've been on Instagram for a week and then they're kind of like, Oh, look, here's my strategy for Instagram success. And they probably will still sell it. But I think the thing is, when I started my big recipe course, it was huge imposter syndrome. And I was very clear that I didn't know everything. And gosh, my SEO knowledge is 20 times what it was when I started. Yeah. But even the price of the course has gone up with that as well. And my confidence and my ability. Launching something when you're not relatively confident about it is very it's a very uncomfortable and unpleasant position because you're always worried you're going to be caught out and and that someone's going to ask you a question that you can't answer. And it's just an uncomfortable place to be. But I don't know. It's a hard one, that, Louisa. Um, I don't want to discourage people from sharing their knowledge. I think you just have to be honest about your knowledge. I think that's it. So if you are just starting out and you're offering a really beginner's level course based on your minimal experience, great. Price it accordingly. If you're a your expert who's launched in a thousand ships you know you can charge a lot more because you're an expert so I think it's just about being honest with your customers um, and people will buy all levels of things as long as you're clear and you don't over promise yeah yeah great point now when you do create a course or actually sell a course I should say how much of it have you typically got ready at the time that you're selling it Or in the example that you've kind of recently done is it something that you kind of sell and then figure out as you go well, look, with the recipe course, that is absolutely what I did. I, I had done the workshop, so I had the raw materials, but I'm like, I am not going to spend three months of my life turning this into a course if no one's bought it. So I, the first time I launched recipe, which I think was back in 2016, I had nothing, nothing at all. I hadn't even worked out how the back end was going to work. Um, and I sold 20 spots. And then I built the course as I went, and it was hideous. <laughs> Or MBN. So I used to have to put the videos onto a USB stick and courier them to my virtual assistant who had better internet than me. So she wow. could upload. We were uploading things minutes before they were due to be live. It was hideous. And it was okay, that course. Like it wasn't great. Since then, I've rebuilt the course about six or seven times. And I have to refresh the content every year because it's as a um, These days, you know, I'm going to be launching a couple of courses at the end of this year. Um, I feel like I have pre-sold them in that I have a very warm audience who are constantly saying to me, can you make a course on this? Can you make a course on this? I haven't got the sales page up, but I feel like I have kind of pre-sold them, but I'm not going to put myself through that stress again. I will have it pretty much built. I say that now. I'm (laughs) sure I 
finishing videos at the last minute because I'm that kind of pose law kind of person. The time to do the thing contracts and that makes me more likely to do it. You know, I just, that's who I am. I'm a deadline driven person. I come from agency land. You always do your concepts two minutes before the credit. Drops up. <laughs> yeah. And as you say, you know, there is some validity in not spending hours and hours of creating something. If you don't think, well, you're not hundred percent sure you've got it right on the mark. Yeah. And I think that's why, you know, funnels are a bit of a dirty word, but they're so important. Like if you cannot get people to take your free checklist that's free or take your micro course that's $27 or your next level course that's $97, they will never buy your $2,000 course. So unless you can get people to do the the early stages, you are being ridiculous because I see so many people just kind of launch, creating these eight-week courses that cost $1,000, $2,000. They have no audience. And they put all that time and effort in and the, the sense of defeat once you've done that and you launch it and you're so excited and then it's like tumbleweeds. It's horrible. So don't do that to yourself. Yeah. Build a lead magnet. Get that out there. Be excited. Oh, great. I've got 100 people on my list now. You know, now let's see if they'll buy the next thing. Oh, great. 50 of them did or 20 of them did. Brilliant. Now the next thing, you know, and it just, it's simple logic that sometimes we're so excited about the thing that we go straight to the big thing. Yeah. We should, and not do that. <laughs> well, that perfectly leads into my question, which was going to be, what is your format for once you've, you know, decided to launch a course? What are the steps that you take to bring that course to your audience? Are you able to talk us through a little bit of, I suppose, you know, knowing now that you've got the context of having an audience and you're offering them these other smaller pieces to try before they get to the big thing, when you're ready to launch your course, what will you do? What are the kind of top five steps that you would follow? I think it's very important to have a wait list. So as soon as you're kind of conscious that you are going to do something, get a very simple sales page up. It doesn't need to have all the detail. It doesn't even necessarily need to have the pricing. Although you'll notice that for the recipe course, unlike a lot of uh, sort of people who have courses, I keep the page live all year with the pricing visible all year because it's expensive and people need to know the price so they can budget for it. So a lot of people don't do that and you kind of, you know, you learn the price on the day it launches. And I feel what that does is it often will cause impulse buying and then a lot of buyers regret. I don't want anybody buying my course. I don't want anyone putting themselves in financial jeopardy. It's really to me that's part of my brand so have a waitlist page up if you don't know your pricing in the format yet that's fine you can just add to that page but start collecting email addresses as soon as possible and then try to start overcoming objections while they're on your waitlist so I send a lot of pre-sales emails going hey look I know you're probably thinking you're not going to have time to do the course well here's how the timing works and here's where the calls are and here's what previous people have said you know so that what by the time launch day comes it's there are no objections you know, the own, they know the price. They know what's included. You've come up, you've answered all their queries. You've invited them to discuss it with you beforehand as well. Like you've maybe done a webinar or an FAQ or something like that. Um, so that on the day that they're, they're ready to buy, you know, so that's super important. In terms of social media, I don't actually do much pre-launch social media because everything I do is pre-launch social media. So, you know, I've got a group of every message I put out there is building my authority and my trust and, you know, that transparency other than that, you know, launch day is just launch day. I whack it up, make sure I have my little Zen chat there so I can guide people through the purchase process because no matter how many times you've explained it, people get stuck or they have questions. Um, and then I try and make that first week of having them on the course just awesome. You know, the course hasn't started yet. You've got no materials, but let's keep up that excitement level. I don't want anyone to have buyer's regret. I want everyone to feel good about their decision. I want them to feel busy and involved. And so I do that through mainly through the Facebook group and, you know, being really active in that. But yeah, I mean, I, again, lots of people have a launch formula. You could make a launch checklist, but it very much depends on you and your brand and who you are. So I just don't think there's a one size fits all approach, you know. When you actually do your launch, is that via email? Like what, what does that launching part look like once you've done that kind of pre-emails and the overcome objections? What's your email look like? Because I think I've heard about a text email that's been really successful. Yeah, I just do one plain text email. Okay. That's all I And uh, that goes out to the wait list, which I've built up. And they get a 24-hour head start on the big list. So I send one plain text email to my big list. Um, and then that's it. I don't send any more emails to my big list because they haven't bought into this process and I don't want to burn my list up by trying to flog a dead horse. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, wow. Well. So I just send one to my wait list. And usually, you know, Michael, that, that big course usually sells out in eight 
eight to 24 hours usually is that one. So I'll send that one out. Then about two hours later, I send another one out, which is usually at the point where we are 60 or 70% sold because I think people don't believe the scarcity. Yes. I do limit the number of people on my course and it is true and real. And it, when it sells out, it sells out. And then I send one telling people that it's sold out. Um, and generally that's when I get about 10 people going, ah, oh, can you squeeze me in? Can you not? And it's, it's so tempting because really what would a difference would another one person make? But if I let another one person in, it just makes my limit nonsense. And I become not a liar essentially, but it becomes a sales tactic and it's not a sales tactic. The reason I only let a certain amount of people in is because there's a lot of support in that group. You yeah. know, it's not popping in and doing a 10 minute live and I don't have a community manager. It's me. So if I have more than people than that, I'm going to get burnout and stress. So yeah, I have to turn people away and that may mean they go and buy someone else's course. But at least they go away knowing that I'm a woman of my word, which is important to me, you know, it's really important. Definitely. Yeah, I like that. And I've heard, you know, a lot of people keep their course open for weeks um, and have a pretty big open period. So having that scarcity and that reason for people to buy, you know, as soon as the doors are open makes a lot of sense. How many people would you typically have in one of the courses that you might do? Now I limit it to 80 uh, we are going to move that up to a hundred because we've got some slightly better systems in place. Cause mm. it's all about, I don't want to overstretch my team as well because I, you know, I'm still a one woman band. I have about 30 hours of VA assistant a, a week. Uh, and I don't want employees. I've tried that path. I don't like it. So, you know, I don't want the course to get so big that I have to employ someone. Yeah funny isn't it because it seems really un- unentrepreneurial but it makes a decent amount of money I'm happy with it I don't want to do the things that would make take me to the next level because I don't want them from a lifestyle perspective you know what I mean well then you end up managing someone else as opposed to doing the bits that you love so I totally get it yeah so yeah about it's about a, a hundred uh, people in the next round will be um and I do three rounds a year and that's more than enough for me So your course sounds really engaging. I can tell from this conversation that if I was to sign up for your course, I would get a lot of support. How, what, what does that course look like then for someone who signs up? How are you delivering it? How often are they checking in with you? What kind of support do you offer? Yeah, so it's it's delivered over a WordPress website with a Divi theme. I don't actually even have an, L- an LMS, a learning management system. So I've actually built my own front end and I coded it myself because, you know, I'm a bit of a hands-on person. So, you know, it looks very different to other people's courses. There's not the little grey accordions opening up and down and completion stuff so it's delivered over that site with vimeo videos and notes there's a lot of a lot of downloadables and templates and worksheets so that people can do the do and there's not just i I break it up into uh, learnings and actions so i actually you know you've learned all the things here's five things you could implement today because i really believe in implementation i think that's really important then we have the facebook group for the for the thing which runs for three months we do coaching calls using Zoom. So they're all, you know, people can come along and they're at set times. And then I do demos and lives in the group. I do Q&As. And I have, you know, regular posts that go into the group. But I'm also kind of spontaneous. So like if I've got half an hour and I'm waiting for a bus, I might go into the group and go, okay, I'm here for half an hour. What do you want to ask me? And people just type in. And I really try and hear own members of the group as well because you obviously get super, some people who are super active. And, and you know, they it's great. Like the other day, someone was like, I can't find this in the course. And two people jumped in and said, oh, it's here. And you're here. <laughs> but, you know, they're just students on the course, which I love. So, yeah, I really try and foster relationships between people on the course. I mean, it's not rocket science. I, as I said, I've never, I don't know if I did say this might be on my, I've never done anybody else's course. So it's really, I don't know how they're supposed to be done. But then I started to speak to a few people who do do courses and they're like, yep, we do that. We do that. And I'm like, great. (laughs) But I just thought about it from the perspective of how would I like this to be, you know, and it's not for everybody, but it's like, how would I like to learn? Well, I like to watch videos, yes, but I'm quite an oral learner, but I really don't learn anything unless I write it down. Some people like to learn through reading. You know, some people learn through doing. So I wanted to incorporate all those different learning modes into the one course. How do you find the balance? Because I think um, one thing that I've heard around courses is the biggest thing to stop someone from completing is overwhelm. So how do you find the balance in all the things that you offer? Because obviously you want to provide as much value as you can, but at the same time you don't want them to, to be overwhelmed and they've already got some existing course materials to work through. When you're looking at, say, the coaching calls or the Q&As or the sessions in your Facebook group, how do you know how much of that to do? 
mean, look, I am an over deliverer. Uh, I really am. And I have to hold myself back because I would be in there every day for eight hours if you let me. <laughs> uh, so, you know, what I do is that there's always a, probably about 50% of the group who are super active in the group and 50% of the group who never turn up in the group at all. So once in a while, I'll just tag a random who hasn't appeared in the group and maybe offer them some help. And they then may be like, look, I am a lurker, but I really appreciated you reaching out to me, you know. I do a weekly roundup of the most important posts in the group via email so that if you didn't want to be in the group, and I encourage people to turn off notifications so they're not getting a million notifications. And I say, look, you know, set learning zones. So, you know, maybe your learning zone is going to be Sunday morning from 10 to 12. You're going to lock your kids out of the, out of the dining room and you're, that's when you're going to learn. Okay, do the learnings on the course and then maybe pop into the Facebook and have a little browse around, you know. Yeah. every. Facebook group is far it's the icing on the cake it's not the cake so the cake is the course and some people just want the cake and some people want the cake the icing and they want the cherries and the sprinkles and the, <laughs> the whole so, lot yeah but you know I'm there to guide them you can't please everybody and if some people find the group overwhelming well then they don't use the group but you know you, you, you can't be everyone's mum there is a certain responsibility for people to kind of turn up and, and digest the content how they want to digest it. But I think giving people options is, is a good, um, yeah, it's, it's a fine balance. And I, I'm not sure I've completely cracked it. As I said, 16 rounds of the course, I'm still changing stuff now. And um, that's good. You know, I think, I think to, I, I don't sit, rest on my laurels, you know, I don't be like, oh yeah, it's all selling great. I'll just leave it. Yeah. I don't, I'm always looking each round to try and improve it a little bit. And 16 rounds is so impressive. Do you ever get tired of it? Do you ever think I could do this in my sleep? Uh, I don't get tired of it because to be perfectly honest and frank and rather crass, it is a huge amount of money to me and my business. And um, so while there have been times where I'm like, I would rather do something else right now, I'd be stupid not to. And I'm very much like, once I get back into it, once I get people on the course and I see their excitement, mm. it gets me excited again. You know, somebody asks me a tricky question and it just triggers that thing in my brain to go, oh yeah, let me go and find the answer to that. And I get excited again. You know, I, I won't do it forever. There will be, it is finite, but you know, at the moment, I still have sufficient passion for it. And I'm a big believer as well that if you run a business based purely on passion and inspiration, you won't have a business for very long. Sometimes it's about persistence and just turn it up. You know, <laughs> totally, totally. Now, Kate, one of the other things I wanted to pick your brain on in this session today is your podcast because you are an amazingly dedicated podcaster. You have recently launched a new podcast, which you've done for 30 days, um, tune in daily during COVID. And you've done some amazing interviews over that period. And thank you for including me in that batch. Um, but in addition to this, you've got your SEO success podcast. What role does podcasting play in your business? Oh, I mean, it, it's huge. So I started my first one, the Hot Copy podcast, which is actually, I think it's, we're nearing like 600,000 downloads for that, which is just insane. But we've been doing it for ages. So it's actually not that impressive. <laughs> I see other podcasters coming along going, I have 300,000 downloads in my first year. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, the Hot Copy one is interesting because it, the ROI for me isn't, exact because I didn't at that point I don't have a course for copywriting I do have a membership it was really important for building up authority and trust and things like that and also learning the SEO one for me that was the one where I really kind of hit the ground running because I needed that podcast as I said digital marketing is vast SEO is vast I can't know everything, but I have an audience that needs to know everything. So me being able to speak to these brilliant people helps my education yeah. you know but also, it kind of, it, it, to a degree, without wanting to sound like an idiot, it put me on the map a little bit. Because if you're interviewing Ran Fishkin from Mars and you're interviewing John Mueller from Google, then other people see you doing that. And they're like, well, she must be important. And it's led to me getting speaking gigs and other opportunities and being invited on other people's podcasts and being involved in c c conversations so like on Twitter, I'll often get tagged in conversations with the likes of famous proper SEO people, you know, um, because I have this platform, you know, the way I describe it is like, you know, rather than being picked for the basketball team, I am the basketball team captain, you know, so I probably get 20 or 30 requests a week from people to be on my podcast and I get to choose. And that's sounds a bit egotistical, but that's a nice place to be in. Um, so that's been great. And that gets a lot of listens and is a very essential part of my funnel, my sales funnel getting people into my uh my facebook group and everything else the k-tune podcast what was i thinking trying to do that <laughs> oh 
got two more episodes left. I'll be glad when it's done because it's taken a lot of time. But again, I think, you know, all I tend to talk about is SEO and copywriting. And to be honest, that's not what I even do anymore. Mm. You know, I'm a you, I'm a digital marketer. I do everything. I'm, I've got, I'm across the board, but I've, I've built this reputation in those two things. So I wanted an opportunity to talk about all the other things that I do and just also talk a bit about who I am a little bit. So it's not as popular as the other ones. It may be one day, but it's more of a personality driven podcast, less a business podcast, I guess. I love it. No, I've been really enjoying listening to all the interviews that you've had. And I think they've been super relevant and covering so many diverse topics. So if you're listening to this, do check out all of Kate's podcasts. Now, how have you grown these podcasts? I mean, I know you've been at it a long time, but obviously you don't just get listeners uh, without putting in some pretty specific effort. Can you tell us what are the top three things that you think have contributed to your podcast listenership? Oh, gosh. I think I think just consistency. Like I know that with Hot Copy, the reason why that's done well is it comes out every two weeks. Belinda is religious about it. Recipe, I just did it when I felt like it. And I've noticed such an uplift in this last year when I've been consistent. So being consistent, you know, having episodes that are bobbed up to the people at the top of people's library, just staying top of mind is one thing. Um, you know, I do promote it across all my socials. So, you know, I, I, you know, I put the episode out, then I promote it again and again and again. I provide assets to my guests and encourage them uh, to promote it. Um, other than that, like, you know, because I try and pick topics that are really relevant to my audience, I am able to sort of seed it into conversations. So when someone says, hey, look, I've got a question about international SEO, maybe I don't want to spend half an hour answering that question again. So I'll go, hey, look, why don't you listen to this episode of the podcast? Um, I've also been lucky enough to be like John Mueller from Google mentioned it as his top three SEO podcasts, which is obviously helpful. Awesome. Um, and you know, I've been voted, got voted top podcast by Ahrefs and a few others. It's been put in a lot of lists because again, there's a lot of SEO podcasts and no disrespect to the other hosts because some of them are brilliant, but some of them are very dry. So taking a bit of a different tack with the podcast, I think was helpful and that got listener loyalty. But honestly, I don't, I, I wish I had an answer. It's like, why did that post go viral? I don't know. You know, I really don't. Because if I could replicate that, Kate Toon podcast would have 300,000 listeners and it doesn't. So I I don't know. I do think a lot of it is just the longevity. You build up an audience and people get to the point where they're like, I've listened to your back catalogue. I'm ready for the next episode and I don't want to miss one. They get a bit of FOMO. So yeah, yeah. I don't. It's interesting, isn't it? I think podcasting is probably one of the tactics for a marketer that doesn't really have a clear path to getting to your audience. You know, as much as other things do, it's still a bit of black magic in there. We're like, yeah, we can do all these steps and not get results, or you can do all these steps and you can get results. And it's uh, still in that trial and error bucket very much. Very much. I mean, I honestly think a lot of digital marketing is in that bucket. I still haven't, you know, people have strategies for Instagram, strategies for emails, but even then they're hit and miss, you know? Yeah. But so powerful. I, I went to an event in Melbourne last year and some lovely man came up to me and he was from Argentina. Tina, Argentina. Argentina. <laughs> who's from there anyway? Uh, South America. And he said, oh my God, like I have listened to every episode of your podcast. I probably listened to 300 hours of your voice because I've listened to all of Hot Copy and all of Recipe. I can't believe I'm meeting you. And, you know, I'm the same with the podcasts I listen to. Like I would take a bullet for Ira Glass from the Amer This American Life, you know, because I've listened to him in Spain. I've listened to him walking my dog. I listened to him when I was up with my child in the middle of the night. He's been a part of my life. <laughs> so true. Well, no direct route. There's no necessary ROI. It's so powerful. Yeah. You know, yeah, I love it. It's amazing, isn't it? Because I think we've all been there where we've kind of, I know, actually, I think it was at, at We Are Podcast, um, which actually is coming up again yes, in I a week. Um, well yeah. So I think it was there first when I had that moment where I was like, wow, I know that voice. Like, I don't know who that person is from looking at them, but that voice is so familiar. And you turn into like an instant fangirl because it's like, oh, I know so much about them and they they have no idea who you are. I think it's quite hilarious, really. It's probably one of those, again, one of those unusual channels where you don't necessarily get that feedback. You don't know who's listening. 
feedback loop really isn't there. You get the odd review, but you know, even though you can love a podcast to death, we always forget to leave the review. You know, yes. it's just a hard thing to remember to do. But yeah, but then you meet people at events. It's it's amazing. You know. Yeah. yeah. And I had a message this week of someone who said, oh, "I love your podcast. It's so relevant." And I'm like, "Oh, thank you. It is so nice to hear that because we we spend all this time and effort on creating it and doing it and putting it together, hoping that it's going to resonate. And you don't really know. So if you're listening to this and you've enjoyed it, please drop Kate and I a message and let us know. We would love to hear. <laughs> well, Kate, thank you so much for being on the show today. It's been awesome to delve into some of what you're working on and thank you so much for sharing some of your recipes for success with us today. Where are the best places for people to find you online? Well, I'm trying to do that whole thing where I create a hub. So you can go to katetoon.com and that's where there's links to all the various uh, sub things that I do in my 72 different websites and 9,000 podcasts. So yeah, katetoon.com. Awesome. Now, we didn't even talk about how you're culling things down a little bit. Can we sneak that in at the end here? Can you tell us what your – has things changed a little bit for you recently? Yes, this, this 30 days of talking to very clever people has made me kind of rethink a little bit and take the approach of, as I said, just because you should – could doesn't mean you should. So I'm just trying to simplify my offering. I guess the approach has been price it low, stack it high. That's, that's a pricing methodology. And now I want to price it high and stack it low. So less things, higher price point, fewer people and a better quality product and not spreading myself too thin because I feel I've been a bit like too little butter over too much bread. <laughs> and I don't want to get burnt out, to be frank, because as you said, it sounds again a bit arrogant or egotistical, but you said at the beginning a bit of a golden touch. That golden touch is, is, is you know, it can be a Midas touch as well mm. in the, everything becomes something sellable and marketable and you, you're selling every part of yourself and you need to keep a bit back because otherwise you'll burn yourself out. Yeah, really wise. And I guess that's part of almost like a maturing of your business as well, isn't it? I'm growing up, Louise. It's finally happening. So exciting. <laughs> well, we look forward to seeing those changes evolve as well and always love your stuff that you do, Kate. So we'll continue to stay in touch and keep an eye on everything that's happening and share your stuff with, with our network as well. So thanks again for being on the show. Thanks for listening. If you liked this episode, please don't just subscribe, but get in touch and tell me that you enjoyed it. The best way to do this is through an iTunes review, but you can also email me or drop me a note on LinkedIn. My recommended action item from today's show is to check in with your audience again and speak to them to get their feedback and input. Come and see me in the Interactive Minds Facebook group where hundreds of marketers have discussions, answer questions, and I share the latest news I'm seeing in the industry. You can access today's show notes at interactiveminds.com forward slash podcast. See you next week.